the police emergency. Oh, uh, I've just found a dead body. The man, apparently around 70 years old, travelled more than 200 miles to get there with no wallet, phone and no ID. Six weeks on, the police still have no idea who he is. Murder. Accident. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the mistress of the man of the mall. stranger to mystery. And on the 11th of December, 2015, mystery struck once again. The unidentified body of a man was found by a cyclist on a remote country track of Dove Stones, Saddles Off. His arms were across his chest. I think if he'd have fallen, he'd have fallen forwards or on his side. He just looked at peace. At peace. He just he looked just like, like, like perfectly like straight. straight. Due to the way that the body was found, the police suspected nothing suspicious or anything out of the ordinary until he was taken to Oldham Mortuary when it was confirmed in the autopsy that the actual cause of death was something of a horrible one death by strychnine poisoning a poisonous and toxic drug which when taken causes excruciating pain to the individual. It produces some of the most dramatic and painful symptoms of any known toxic reaction, making it quite noticeable and a common choice for assassinations and poison attacks. For this reason, strychnine poisoning is often portrayed in literature and film, such as The Murder Mistress, written by Agatha Christie. Hence why it's also known as the Agatha, the Agatha Christie, Christie drug. drug. Ten to twenty minutes after exposure, the body's muscles begin to spasm starting with the head and neck. The spasms then spread to every single muscle in the body with continuous convulsions and they get worse at the slightest of movement. The convulsions then progress increasingly and they intensify as the backbone arches continually. Convulsions lead to lactic acidosis and hypothermia. Death comes from asphyxiation caused by paralysis of the neutral pathways that control the breathing or by exhaustion from the convulsions. The subject usually dies within two to three hours of exposure. So how can someone who suffered such a horrific ending look at peace? 
lay with their arms folded across. I'm not disputing that he was found that way by the innocent man that discovered the body. But was there somebody with our mystery man that fatal day in 2015? Someone who made the body look the way it did. This sort of little lay-by that you can see here, this is the spot where David spent his final, uh, his final seconds. And his body was discovered here. A um, couple of contradicting sort of um, things from the police. One was saying he was lay face down, one said he was sort of propped up, and the other saying he was lay with his arms cross facing. Basically, all this that you can see the beauty of dove stones. It's absolutely stunning. Um, but, like I say, we're pretty sure that this little patch here. This is where David's body was discovered back in 2015. But this is what he would have saw for his, his final few minutes or seconds, however long it took him. For the next 18 months, the case baffled the police. Who is this man? This is one of the last images of him alive. The next day, his body was found lying face up on Saddleworth Moor. The man, apparently around 70 years old, traveled more than 200 miles to get there with no wallet, no phone, and no ID. He was given the name Neil Dovestorm by the mortuary, rather than your typical John Doe. Dove stones only seemed fitting, as this was the location that the body was discovered. But suddenly, after extensive research, there was finally a breakthrough. And the true identity of Mr. Dovestone was revealed through DNA. His name was David Lautenberg. But after a family dispute, he changed his name to David Lytton. He was a 67 year old man who once worked as a London tube driver. He lived in the south of London, but kept himself to himself and had very little to do with any of his neighbours. But upon question, they all described him as a nice enough guy and was very polite, but he was very much a harmless loner. He did live alone. For the last 10 years of David's life, he lived in the suburbs of Pakistan's capital, Lahore. As to why he moved out there, nobody really knows. Some reports say he left due to a family argument, others claiming that he just wanted a change of lifestyle. But ultimately, David never told anyone he was leaving and he left everything behind to pursue a new life in the hall. David had finances to live quite a lavish lifestyle in the hall. But strangely, he lived of very simple means, kept things very low key just like he did in England. For some unbeknown reason, David had the sudden urge to fly back to the UK. And this 
is where the story starts to get strange. His next movement was recorded at being in Lahore Airport, demanding frantically to get the next flight back to England. When he arrived, he'd booked to stay at a travel lodge in Ealing for five days, paying £307 in cash. But he would only end up staying for one night. The next day he got the train from Ealing to London Euston, then boarded the train from Euston to Manchester Piccadilly. He was spotted on CCTV cameras, browsing the shops, talking to the ticket staff, which sadly, upon question, don't remember speaking to him. He also stopped for a sandwich, which he ate at the station, and spent a total of 53 minutes at Manchester Piccadilly. It's then believed that David entered a taxi and was asked to be taken to Greenfield, which is situated in Oldham, only a short walk from Dovestones. When he arrived in Greenfield, he entered the Clarence pub and asked the landlord, how do I get up to the top of that mountain? The landlord responded and gave David the directions. He just came in uh, up to the bar and asked for the directions to the top of the mountain. It's only a, a, a small hill really, and most people know it either, they'd either call it Dove Stones or Indian's Head, which is at the top of the mountain. And I explained the route to the top of the hill, and uh, I just said to him that uh, he won't get there and back today in, in what's left of the daylight. And he said, oh right, thank you. Um, asked me the directions again, so I explained to him again, and that's it, off he went. It wasn't raining, but it was cold and dark. It was turned two o'clock, and it goes dark at four o'clock, so there's no way he would have got to the top and back before a loss of light. He was an old man, and he was dressed in uh, normal clothes, a lightweight uh, raincoat, slip-on shoes, and uh, he wasn't dressed for walking up the hill in the weather. And that's, what, uh, that's why I remembered him really, because he wasn't dressed for the occasion. This was the last time that anyone would speak to him. The next day, David's body was sadly discovered by a cyclist on a remote country track of Dovestones. His arms were across his chest. I think if he'd have fallen, he'd have fallen forwards or on his side. He just looked at peace. At peace. He just he looked, looked like, like, like perfectly, perfectly straight. He was lay on his back, facing up at the sky. His arms crossed, accompanied only by the sound of nature, and cradled in the arms of the never-ending view. Found on the body was a hundred and thirty pound, all in ten pound notes, return train tickets, and a bottle inscribed with Arabic writing. Once translated, the police confirmed that the tablets were for a thyroid problem, but the contents of the bottle was not for medication. It was in fact a toxic poison of strychnine. The question marks around this whole case are overwhelming. Why did David leave Lahore to come back to the UK, having the sudden urge to go to Dovestones? He had no connection to the area, and he'd never visited the place before. Another question is why did David have a medication bottle for a thyroid problem, but the contents contained the toxic strychnine poison? Was he under the impression 
that there were in fact thyroid tablets? Or did he know that the bottle contained strychnine? Was he poisoned by his doctor or another person? Was it suicide? Did David know exactly what he was doing? Did he want to leave us in suspense? An unsolved, An unsolved mystery. mystery. These are just a few of the questions that have been thrown around online. What do you think? Please comment below. Having read reports and watched documentaries about the mystery of David Lerner, curiosity got the better of me. And I felt compelled to retrace the footsteps that David took that very day back in 2015. And if possible, try to get into his mindset a little. So we're just trying to find the car park spot and uh, we've been down this road for about 10 minutes now and we've had to just sort of do a U-turn at right where the sort of Moore's murders um, all took place. But if you just look behind me here at the side, it's just white, everything's white, you can't even see the sky with that eye up, it's just sort of in the clouds a bit. Um, but we're going to drop down now and try and drop down into dust stones and find some sort of car park spot because we're a bit snookered at the minute. Right, so here I am and I'm outside the Clarence pub in uh, Greenfield and this was one of the last places that um, David was actually sort of seen and the last person to speak to him was the landlord of this pub. Um, and he came in this pub. You'll probably see something already in the doc in the uh, vlogumentary. Um, but basically, he came to this pub to ask for directions. Now, he asked, "How does he get up to the top of the mountain?" And the uh, landlord came outside, and he told him twice the route to get up. And he basically told him to walk all the way up this hill, and you'll get to Dust Stones. And um, what we're going to do now is actually do the same route and the same footsteps that David actually took that that day that he was um, that he was last seen. We're basically making our way up to Indian Z. Now, there's quite a bit of a conflict between where he was actually going, because the papers sort of said he, he asked for Indian Z when he was at the Clarence pub. Apparently he asked um, how to get up to Indian Z. And I believe that's a bit of a myth because when I've watched the footage of the um, the bloke who owned the pub, the landlord, he actually said he didn't ask for Indians head, he just said, how do I get up that mountain? Um, so we're sort of climbing up there now, uh, making our way up to Indians head, and I think there's a bit of a lay-by and that's where his body was found. But we're just trying to retrace his steps. Sorry, I'm just getting a bit out of breath because very steep, isn't it's, it? real, <laughs> <laughs> it's really steep. Dad just nearly went on his ass. Um, but we're trying to retrace his steps to sort of get, in his, get inside the mind of him a little bit. Because um, there's so many theories that it could have been, which we'll delve into later on. But other than it being an absolutely beautiful little spot and a beautiful place. Um, it's still sort of having me scratch my head a little bit, but like I say, we'll delve into that in a bit. And we're just heading up to Indian Z now, so we'll jump back on soon. So I've been adamant all week um, that I believed he was killed. Um, purely down to all the, the sort of inconclusiveness, like the way he was found. The fact that his arms was folded and had this peaceful look on his face and sort of indicated to me that there was another, there was definitely some foul play along the way um, because even his brother said he wasn't the type of person to take his own life. They just said there was no way that his brother would have done that. And, um, you know, there's just too many questions around it. And that's what's had me I, I, like really scratching my head because the fact that he travelled 200 miles, I mean, originally from Pakistan then to London and all the way here, he's got no connection to this area whatsoever. 
He's never been recorded to have been here. He's got no fascination or obsession with Dove Stone. So why would you travel all that way? Um, with no passport, no ID, no phone. He had £130, all in £10 notes. It's just really strange. And then the fact that he, he wanted... Uh, to me, I don't know. Maybe he was meeting someone up here. And um, something went on. Now, if you would have took this... You know, I've probably already said it in the video, but he took this sort of poison. Then his body would have been all distorted and twisted. He wouldn't have been lay the way he were. And he wouldn't have been really peaceful looking. He'd have convulsed and everything. Um, and the fact that he was coming up here at like two o'clock and it's... I mean, what time is it now? Just one second. It's two, well, 20 past two now. And it is starting to sort of go dark. It's, it's on its way anyway. It's starting to go dark a little. Um, just a weird time to come up here. Not dressed for the occasion. Nothing. Um, and then it, in my head, it could have been my own sort of paranoia. But I'm just trying to think in every sort of aspect. And as daft as it sounds, like was he some sort of spy? Um, because... One of the major, which I was reading about this Strychnine, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Strychnine or Strickling, whatever it's called. Um, it's, it's used in assassinations by other countries, especially the Russians. Um, they use this poison to make it look like sort of an accidental death or... Basically, it's one of the main ingredients that they use when they assassinate people. So now I was sort of thinking, was it some sort of agent? And I could be completely wrong, but like I say, I'm sort of speculating because it's a mystery. It's a real mystery. Um, but then walking around here, I sort of can see the reason why, you know, if he was to take his own life, it's a beautiful little place. And I don't personally, you know, when people commit suicide, it's absolutely horrible. You just don't know what's in the mindset of anyone, do you? Um, so, if he was to do it, maybe he had enough of Pakistan and the hustle of bustle of living in Lahore and he missed the traditional sort of British feel and he wanted a bit of the countryside and maybe he took his own life. But I don't think we'll ever get to the bottom of this completely. But what I will ask, and I will put in the video, is if you have an idea or any sort of suggestion, just comment below. And I'm going to leave the sort of helpline to this whole case. I'll try and leave like a link to it. So keep your eye out for it or the phone number. Whether, I know it sounds really, it's really random, but maybe you saw him that day or something. I, I don't know. It was 2015 so it wasn't that long ago but i'll leave a helpline open and just comment oops nearly went then <laughs> just comment below um what you actually think because i'd love to know your um maybe your theory on it so we just sort of stopped for a little break grab something to eat Dad's actually brought the coffee today. Proper coffee. You always slag my brew off as well. This is oh. Morrison's finest. <laughs> what? So we've come to a conclusion or what? Look at them. Hey, we've moved on since Mr. Kipling. Look at these triple chocolate muffins. <laughs> Morrison's finest. Look at that. Dare to take part? Yes, definitely. Look at that. Look at that. So, we've sort of retraced his footsteps and. Uh, all week in my head, I've had it in my head that he's, there's something more to it and, and I reckon there was some sort of foul play involved and that's what I've had in my head all week. 
But like I say, we've retraced his footsteps and sort of tried our best to get into his mindset a little bit. Um, and obviously suicide, it's silent killer, isn't it? And you really don't know what people are thinking uh, deep down. And you don't know how, how sad certain people can be. Like, people can be... Um, one minute you think that they're absolutely fine and then the next minute they've taken their own life. So you really don't truly know what's going on in people's head at the time. Um, so I can't possibly rule out that he didn't kill himself, which is what the police have said. Um, there could have been an accidental overdose of his strychnine poisoning, is it? Yeah. It could be a complete accidental death, or it could be foul play. Um, I'll make a real proper conclusion towards the end of the video, um, but as now, as it stands, I still don't, <laughs> still none of the wiser. It's the time of the day as well. It was like late afternoon, so we only had like about an hour or two, of, well, if that, because it, it was December, an hour or two of uh, uh, light left in the day, and he wasn't dressed, he just had like a a coat and jacket on and a pair of like slip-on shoes he also had hundred and i think hundred and odd pound in his pocket as well and a return ticket to houston so it's it's a mystery i'm 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 looking at it from did he come here to kill himself yeah it's possible because it's um it, it's an ideal place i know it's not an ideal place but it's so peaceful here it's unbelievable stunning stunning like scenery I mean, if you listen now, if we both stop talking. It's absolutely silence, silence peace. He just, he just loved at peace. peace. I understand sort of both angles. I do believe, part of me believes that there's definitely a third party involved. There's definitely somebody has bumped him off and made it look like a suicide because there's no way his body could have been found the way it did after taking the strychnine. There's no way. It, um, he was it makes you out. convulse. It makes your body spasm. It yeah. would have been a real mess. It would have been an absolute mess. It makes, makes all your joints um, spasm. And, and the way he was found off this uh, guy on a, on a bike, just, um, just a mountain light. biker, he said he looked like he was asleep. Yeah. He was laid out as if he'd been laid out. And he, he was... He was laid like, with his hands sort of like this. He was peaceful. And peaceful. So, which makes me think it... You know, if he was to take the strychnine, he'd have been absolutely... Contorted. His, his body would have been all twisted up. So mm. that's what makes me sort of think, was there another party involved that made it look like a suicide? He was taking tablets for um, overactive thyroid. And um, the tablets he got were from Pakistan. But that's the only place it's legal, I think, strychnine, isn't it? Strychnine. That and China. Uh, yeah, where they use it to kill moles and vermin, they rats. They use it to kill dogs yeah. in China. And um, maybe somebody slipped him in, knowing that at one point he will take the tablets for his overactive thyroid. So was it done in Pakistan? Was it done here? Did he do it himself? It's just this a also, This also makes me beg to sort of sort of swing towards the accidental overdose thing is because I did read that in um, small doses, strychnine can be used as a performance enhancer. Um, so did he sort of, his brother said it was really windy that day and it could have blew in his face and it, he's, he's sort of overdosed on that or something. I really don't know. Um, so it's still a bit of an head scratcher. And like we say, we're only having a walk round here now. I'm going to try and make our way a bit further up towards Indian Zed. I know he, he wasn't found um, at Indian Zed, but it was a bit of a lay-by near it. So we are still going to walk and trying to get into the mindset a little bit more. And maybe it, it'll open up the story a bit, but as of now, it's still a mystery. Only David truly knows what went on that day. Was he going to meet someone? Was there more to it? Or did he in fact take his own life? A theory that's been suggested is that when David was working on the tube, he saw the beautiful scenery of Dove Stone on an advertising board. 
did this image fixate itself inside the mind of it? Was it a burning ambition to end his life in such a beautiful place? Who knows? I suppose we all have our own demons and we never know what's going on inside the mind of others. This is why it's so important to check on people from time to time. So much as a phone call, a quick text, a smile to a stranger. It can literally change the mindset and mood of an individual. As we're all fighting our own battles, and you never really know what people are going through on the inside. If I was to throw my eggs in one basket and make a conclusion, I would say that David did in fact take his own life and he was suffering with depression. The erraticness and strange behaviour is a trait of someone that is on the edge. The fact that he was walking around a place like Manchester Piccadilly, a place heavily camered up, to me seemed like David knew exactly what he was doing. And he left us little clues along the way. I think he knew there would be a mystery around his death. death. And that was his way of doing it. But as to why the body was found in the position it was in, will always baffle me. And it wouldn't surprise me in the future if other people come forward and the story changes once again. So we've just basically followed the whole trail from the reservoir um, all the way through Dove Stones. I've come across this track here. Now we're trying to pinpoint the best that we can. There's been a couple of spots where we sort of thought it could have been, but I'm 95% sure that this sort of little lay-by that you can see here, this is the spot where David spent his final um, his final seconds. And his body was discovered here. A um, couple of contradicting sort of um, things from the police. One was saying he was laid face down, one said he was sort of propped up, and the other saying he was laid with his arms cross facing. Basically all this that you can see. The beauty of Dove Stones, it's absolutely stunning. Um, but like I say, we're pretty sure that this little patch here, this is where David's body was discovered back in 2015. This is what he would have saw for his, his final few minutes or seconds, however long it took him.